the war on terror took a new turn. When Attorney General Eric Holder announced that the U.S. has clear authority to kill anyone believed to be a terrorist, including U.S. citizens abroad. This week on American Dream, we explore the U.S. war on terrorism. Just where is it headed? I'm your host, Nisa Islam. While speaking at Northwestern University, Attorney General Eric Holder shocked the world when he announced that it may not be feasible to capture a U.S. citizen terrorist if he suspected of an imminent threat or attack. Here's what he said. Now let me be clear. An operation using lethal force in a foreign country targeted against a U.S. citizen who is a senior operational leader of Al-Qaeda or Associated Forces and who was actively engaged in planning to kill Americans would be lawful at least in the following circumstances. First, the U.S. government has determined after a thorough and careful review that the individual poses an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States. Second, capture is not feasible. And third, the operation would be conducted in a manner consistent with applicable law of war principles. Our guests this week are Dr. Wilmer Leon, political commentator and professor of political science at Howard University, Abed Ayub, legal director at the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and Imam Mohammed Al-Asi. I asked them to start by defining just what a terrorist is. You know, it's one of those words that uh, everyone has their own slant in defining it. I don't think there's a standard definition of it, but uh, reading through the literature and um, the way the mainstream media tries to um, zero in on it, it would be a person or an organization, uh, a state or a sub-state system that utilize uh, violence, and then here the word violence itself needs further definition, but anyways, that, that uh, uh, prefers violence to achieve its usually political ends. That is the boilerplate definition of terrorist, and anyone can use that. Uh, from their own angle or their own perspective in uh, defining their um, uh, untamed enemies. I think that depends somewhat on who you ask. Uh, the adage is one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. But in terms of uh, um, um, Attorney General Eric Holder, uh, he has stated that a terrorist is an individual that poses an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States. Now that seems simple on its face, but how that is actually uh, determined or assessed, I believe can vary. Um, and I think a clear example of that would be uh, this recent um, editor of the Atlanta Jewish Times, Andrew Adler, in his piece, What Would You Do? And he stated there were three options for Israel in terms of their security. And his third option was that Israel could have U.S. based Mossad agents assassinate the president. Well, from my perspective, that is calling upon an act of terrorism in this country. But others seem to have just dismissed this as the rantings of, of some, you know, lunatic journalists. So some of this, I think, really depends. But but had had Minister Farrakhan written that. Had, um, had, had Reverend Jackson said that, or had Reverend um, um, Jeremiah, Wright. Jeremiah Wright said that, then America would be, an up, would be up in arms and, and they would probably have been arrested by now. Well, I mean, a terrorist could be anyone that is, is inflicting harm uh, onto others. A terrorist, uh, we have to make clear and, and ascertain that it is, it is not defined by uh, a certain race or religion. So a terrorist could be anyone that's 
perpetrating violence, anyone that's perpetrating harm onto others and those around him uh, in, in the name of something extreme. So that's, you know, in my definition what terrorism is. I think there's probably uh, different variations out there. But the, uh, the definition of terrorism is not secluded to one community. That's got to be made clear. Attorney General Eric Holder mentioned that the U.S. is at war. What war is he talking about? The war in Afghanistan? The war on terrorism? I asked our guests. Well, you know, the war on terror, I think, uh, became uh, 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 a household word after 9-11. You may, you may find it here and there before that, but it became sort of uh, an everyday word after 9-11. And it was basically coined uh, with such a usage in the corridors of power in the United States. And uh, from there on, it was meant to target uh, almost exclusively uh, Islamic self-determination. I think, you know, uh, according to uh, George Bush, our prior president, Amer he did start the war on terrorism. Uh, is America in a war on terrorism now? Uh, I mean, I can't speak for the government agencies, um, but I mean, uh, we don't need to be in any more wars. I think the, the cost of the wars in this country have already taken their tolls. I wouldn't really classify it as an expansion as much as I would consider it to be a continuation of established policies and practices from the Bush administration. Anwar al-Awlaki, also known as Imam Anwar, was born in New Mexico. He held a BS in civil engineering from Colorado State University, an MA in education leadership from San Diego State University, and was working on a doctorate degree in human resource development at George Washington University. The FBI investigated him from June 1999 through March 2000 for possible fundraising for Hamas, links to Al-Qaeda, and an early visit in 2000 by a close associate of the blind sheikh, Omar Abdel Rahman. The 9-11 Commission report indicated that Mr. al was highly respected by two of the hijackers as a religious figure. Authorities say two of the hijackers held many closed-door meetings with him, which led investigators to believe Anwar al knew about the 911 attacks in advance. Anwar al was considered an influential player in efforts to radicalize and incite American Muslims to commit terrorist acts. He was placed on a kill or capture list in 2010. Last year, he was targeted and killed in Yemen by a CIA drone. Samir Khan, another U.S. citizen, was also killed in the attack. Why are we seeing this expansion in U.S. authority? Our guests explain. That is a, the $100 million question. If, if I knew the answer to that, um, I would be able to have a much greater impact in terms of analysis of the, of the, of the uh, 2012 presidential election. There are some who say that President Obama is being pressured by Republicans and conservative Democrats to take these stands. There are those who believe that the policies that President Obama ran on are not necessarily his inherent political policies. Uh, some have said that now that he's in the office, that his, uh, his reality has changed and he has to change to meet that reality. Well, it's, it's certainly a, a, an expansion of powers that is uh, disturbing not only to our community, but to the civil rights and civil liberties community and the human rights community as a whole. Uh, to call for the assassination of anyone uh, is troubling, and to you know be able to call for the assassination of an American-born citizen is uh, certainly treading uh, waters um, and pushing the uh, civil rights community to, to a brink on, on issuing something. I mean, it's definitely a major concern. Uh, it's certainly a major concern to the community. It's a major concern to the human rights community. Uh, and I can't speak to why they're doing this, uh, but it, it seems to be another tool uh, given to them through you know, uh, legislation such as the Patriot Act and through other post-9-11 powers that were given to the U.S. government. Exercising these powers is definitely a concern uh, to the community. It is a continuation of the neocon Bush administration. So when these, same, when these politicians of the same frame of mind came together, went back to the drawing board, realized that wars are not going to work here. We haven't really accomplished anything as far as the uh, stated objectives are concerned. So what do we do now? 
Well, another way of uh, achieving the same results is to go after uh, what they may call high assets, uh, organizers, uh, ideologues, uh, commanders, um, uh, individuals who they may call enemy combatants, etc., etc. All of this is puzzling to many around the country. The so-called global war on terror is a phony war, writes Tom Eli and Barry Gray. It was conjured up to provide an overarching political framework for a turn by the United States to unbridled militarism abroad and police state measures domestically. Its geographical scope is the entire planet, its duration is unbounded, and its enemies are determined by the political exigencies of U.S. imperialist foreign policy. Moreover, its initial justification, the events of 9 remains shrouded in mystery, including the apparent role of U.S. intelligence and security agencies in facilitating the terrorist plot. What about due process? What about the rights of Americans? Attorney General Eric Holder explains. United States citizenship alone does not make, does not make such individuals immune from being targeted. But it does mean that the government must take into account all relevant constitutional considerations with respect to United States citizens, even those who are leading efforts to kill innocent Americans. And of these, the most relevant is the Fifth Amendment's due process clause which says that the government may not deprive a citizen of his or her life without due process of law. The Supreme Court has made clear that the due process clause does not impose one size fits all requirement, but instead mandates procedural safeguards that depend on specific circumstances. In cases arising under the due process clause, including in a case involving a US citizen captured in the conflict against Al Qaeda, the court has applied a, a balancing approach, weighing the private interest that will be affected against the interest the government is trying to protect and the burdens the government would face in providing additional process. I asked our guest to explain what attorney holders' words mean for American civil liberties. Well, let me first say that uh, I believe that Attorney General Holder is wrong on the law, he's wrong on the politics, and he's wrong, he's on the wrong side of history. Um, he's just flat out wrong. Most people that I've heard talk about this are talking about this in the context of the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. But I think this argument really starts with section, with Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution in terms of a bill of attainder. And Article 1, Section 9 says that uh, uh, no bill of attainder shall be passed. And what that a bill of attainder is a government declaration that a person is guilty of a crime that carries the death penalty without the benefit of a jury trial. And so what else is the government? What is what else is the government's determination to kill an American citizen without judicial proceedings, judicial proceedings other than a bill of attainder? And so Eric Holder is not only wrong in terms of the 14th Amendment, he's wrong in terms of Article 1, Section 9. And I, I just don't understand, A, how he could come to these conclusions, and B, why more people in this country are not outraged, especially when you combine this action with the president having signed the 2012 Defense Authorization Act, wherein it it allows for the indefinite detention of American citizens, which violates Article 1, Section 9, habeas corpus. Where this president, as a constitutional scholar, is headed with this is, is frightening. As far as the United States is concerned, uh, there is a constitution that this country has. There is a Bill of Rights that goes with that constitution. And from that, there are civil liberties and freedoms, natural rights, civic rights, political rights that the ordinary citizen has lived with in the past, I don't know how many years. And now that the, uh, the world condition is shaping up to be at odds with American foreign policy, 
an American foreign policy um, a calcifying into this position of defending the Israeli nation state right or wrong. Uh, this being the case, the paranoia that has uh, burrowed deep down inside the psychology of the political class in this country has turned their attention to American citizens now. And so they're beginning to think that Muslims who are American citizens or minorities who are American citizens or naturalized American citizens or um, uh, those who are living here legally uh, who are not American citizens, who should have the constitutional rights that every uh, inhabitant of this country should have. Now they're beginning to be targeted uh, in a very uh, offensive way, in a very unlawful way. I think this definitely impacts American civil liberties in a negative way. I think uh, the fact that you claim that you could take away the life of an American uh, citizen in the name of a uh, terrorism or in the name of national security is definitely concerning. One thing that needs to be made clear is that all Americans, uh, just, as, just as everybody else in the world, uh, want to protect their country, want to make sure they're safe at home. But you want to be able to ensure that you want to be able to ensure that you're protecting this country and you're not giving up your uh, liberties in doing so. You want to be feel protected by both the government uh, at the same time. You don't want to worry about the government, you know, inflicting harm or taking away your rights. Many have criticized this speech. While the speech is a gesture towards additional transparency, Haina Shamsi, director of the ACLU's National Security Project, explains it is ultimately a defense of the government's chillingly broad claimed authority to conduct targeted killings of civilians, including American citizens, far from any battlefield without judicial review or public scrutiny. Few things are as dangerous to American liberty as the proposition that the government should be able to kill citizens anywhere in the world on the basis of legal standards and evidence that are never submitted to a court, either before or after the fact. Anyone willing to trust President Obama with the power to secretly declare an American citizen an enemy of the state and order his extrajudicial killing should ask whether they would be willing to trust the next president with that dangerous power. On the streets of D.C., I asked people their thoughts on the government's clear authority to target Americans for death. I'm really not a proponent of the, the death penalty, uh, so, you know, I... I don't necessarily think that's that's fair, you know, so um, that's, you know, really about it. You know, I think, uh, you know, incarceration is, is good enough to, you know, take care of people and deter crime, so. I'm opposed to it. Why? Civil rights. I mean, this, this, this country was founded on liberty, on the principles of liberty. I like our Constitution, um, particularly when it comes to American citizens. Due process, you know, if they have all the proof and absolutely can prove it, then I, yes. But I think it's, you know, we have to do due process. We have to be very careful about who, how we treat our citizens, you know. Uh, Got to be sure about these things. So I don't particularly agree with that, you know. I just uh, uh, think that we should follow the law of our country, give them due process. The guilty didn't, you know, deal with it. But just to go and kill somebody and then make a mistake afterward, you know, in front of you made a mistake. That, that, that's what frightens me. On the streets of D.C., many people had never even heard of Attorney General Eric Holder's remarks. I asked our experts, why isn't the media informing the American public about this? Well, I think you have a number of Americans that are alarmed. Uh, as far as the media, I think they're um, busy covering uh, you know, other issues that I think most Americans care about, the economy, the elections, and so forth. Uh, there has been some media coverage to it, um, and I think there should be a little bit more attention given to it. Um, and maybe it's just not a story that they feel compelled to cover, but it's certainly something that deserves a little bit more attention from the public. Well, the media is being uh, the media is being drawn into this war, and the and we're beginning to see two types of medias here. 
there's the mainstream media, the corporate media, the big business media. That type of media has taken sides with the government. It has become, this first appeared very obviously in what was called the embedded correspondence in Iraq. When the U.S. declared war and went militarily into Iraq, the, uh, the, the people of the media who were assigned to go there, the correspondents and the freelancers, and when they went there, they had to go there and report on terms that were vetted by the Pentagon. They weren't there to report as free journalists communicating the truth and the facts in the field to the people back home. They were there in the tanks. Uh, they had supervisors, media supervisors from the Pentagon. And so they were reporting in ways that would serve the national interests of the United States. Whether that agreed with the truth or not was besides the issue. First of all, because they're so focused on same-sex marriage and a woman's uh, uh, right to control her own body that they're losing focus on things that really matter such as education, unemployment, and the administration's attempt to undermine our civil rights and civil liberties. They're focused on the wrong thing. Americans that know about this are alarmed. I asked our guests what could they do to express their dissatisfaction. Well, I think now is the time for them to step out of their cocoons. Uh, the Americans have been, more, more or less, have been living, especially if we compare them to other parts of the world, they've been living in a very comfortable economic zone and social atmosphere. But now with all of this happening, the catastrophes of American foreign policy having blowback effects on the economic condition in the United States, people losing their jobs, people right now in record numbers on food stamp, 50 million Americans or more don't have proper health insurance, uh, the jobs uh, that are leaving the United States to other parts of the... So the, the, the average person in the United States should feel right now that this is the time that they have to step up to the plate and have to make a political statement. You can't make this as an individual. You can't make it as a few individuals. There really has to be a movement of people. We're talking about millions of people. I think what the public can do, the ones that are concerned about this, is to contact their uh, elected officials, contact their members of Congress, and advocate for taking away such powers and advocate for, you know, protecting the national interest of your community, protecting the civil rights and civil liberties of the community. And it's time to repeal some of these post-9-11 legislations. It's time to get rid of the Patriot Act. It's time to get rid of the authorities that are allowing for, you know, agencies like the NYPD to spy on the Muslim community. It's time to get rid of uh, these acts of legislations and these powers given to these entities uh, that are taking away our civil rights and liberties. And it's, it's certainly time to advocate for the stopping of those uh, powers. They need to be doing what the, what the Occupy uh, movements are doing. They need to be protesting in front of the Department of Injustice, if, that's what, if, if these are the types of policies that Attorney General Holder wants to, uh, wants to uh, implement. Then they need to be picketing and, and protesting in front of the Department of Injustice. They need to be picketing and protesting in front of the White House. They need to be letting our elected officials understand very clearly. They need to be emailing and faxing and, and, and texting and tweeting and calling uh, their elected representatives, letting them know that, as, Frederick, as uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin said, those who will sacrifice liberty for security deserve neither. That in spite of the apparent threats to our, uh, to our security, our Constitution is sacrosanct. And that when we start to uh, sacrifice our civil liberties for apparent security, uh, we then become no better than the so-called dictators that we whose countries we have invaded and whose assassinations we have played 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 a part in. If President Obama or any other president can sit in the White House and determine on their own that a particular individual is an enemy combatant or a terrorist and dispatch our CIA or dispatch uh, an, our, our Navy SEALs or some other uh, element of our, of our military to assassinate that individual, what's the difference between that president and Saddam Hussein?
What's the difference between that president and so-called the, 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 the madman of, of uh, Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi? What is the, what is the uh, difference between that individual and so many of the other di evil dictators who have massacred their own people uh, in the name of protecting their own, uh, their own government? It's a new day in America. And while the government claims it's enacting these rules and regulations to keep Americans safe, Many believe it's only causing fear and hostility at home as well as abroad. Constitutional experts are witnessing the trampling of rights and civil liberties. Many Americans don't even know what's going on, and if they do, they're not quite sure how things will affect them. Is this the American dream? For Press TV in Washington, I'm Nisa Islam. كلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم. The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The noble messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is revered and loved by all Muslims. But there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known. And that is the treaties he entered into, as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sirah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International. P.O. Box 747, Gorby, Ontario, L0H1G0. Or call us, 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.